It is April 1947. A new Bell X-1 transonic airplane is tested at Muroc Dry Lake in the Mojave Desert, north of Los Angeles. Attached to a Boeing B-29 bomber, the X-1 is carried to 25,000 feet. When the B-29 drops it, the X-1 will glide back to the lake bed without firing its rocket engine. The airplane has been designed to do something never before achieved. Within seven months, it will fly faster than the speed of sound. The Smithsonian Institution's National Air and Space Museum is the most visited museum in the world. Its collection contains some of the most important aircraft and spacecraft in history. Craft that were designed, built, and flown by men and women who have expanded the frontiers of flight. This is one of three X-1 airplanes built by the Bell Aircraft Corporation to study the problems of flight at transonic and supersonic speeds. Of the three, this is the best known because on October 14, 1947, Captain Charles Chuck Yeager, a test pilot with the United States Air Force, flew it faster than the speed of sound. The flight demolished the myth of a sound barrier and opened the way for supersonic flight. This is the story of the Bell X-1 and the long and difficult quest to fly faster than the speed of sound. In World War II, piston-engined airplanes reached almost their full potential. As they moved closer to the speed of sound, the efficiency of propellers dropped off. A new source of power was sought, and experiments were carried out with a variety of jet and rocket power systems. Another problem emerged. It was called compressibility. Approaching the speed of sound, air molecules compress and form what at the time appeared to be a wall in front of an airplane. In March 1945, the Bell Aircraft Corporation was awarded a contract to develop three airplanes to research this problem. They would need to withstand great stresses. Military air fighters are designed to 9G. This airplane, all commercial airplanes, are designed to 4G, structural integrity. So the decision was made to double it for the X-1 and build it to 18G. It was practically, well, it was indestructible in flight. You, you couldn't do a maneuver that would tear the airplane up. Compressibility couldn't be studied in the conventional wind tunnels of the time. In 1939, engineer Ezra Kotcher suggested that the Army Air Corps develop an aircraft to study the problems of transonic and supersonic flight. His idea was revived in 1944, when fighters like the P-38 and P-47 began to experience compressibility problems in high-speed dives. Kotcher and a team at Wright Field came up with a design which Kotcher presented to the Army Air Corps and the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics. Robert Woods, a Bell Aircraft design engineer, convinced his company to become involved. In March 1945, Bell was awarded a contract to build three experimental aircraft. The fuselage design they adopted was influenced by the shape of a 50 caliber bullet, which was known to be stable at supersonic speed. The aircraft were to be rocket powered. In the late 1930s, rocket engineer James Wilde developed a small and highly efficient rocket motor using liquid propellants. 
With three friends who were also interested in rockets, he formed a company called Reaction Motors Incorporated to exploit it. Early in World War II, the United States Navy began experiments at Annapolis, Maryland, using rockets to assist the takeoff of heavily loaded Catalina flying boats. Reaction Motors negotiated a contract with the Navy, and James Wilde's little rocket was developed as a JATO, or Jet Assisted Takeoff Unit, and was successfully tested on a Martin Mariner flying boat. Like NACA and the Army Air Force, the Navy was interested in building an airplane that could exceed the speed of sound. It began work on a project called the D-558 and needed a rocket engine. They decided to put what was essentially four of these JATO units together, uh, wrap a lot of string around them, and supply them from a pump. It took a long time to do. Um, during that time, the Air Force decided they would get the jump on the Navy and produce a supersonic airplane uh, before the D-558. The uh, rocket motor end of it, the assembly of four, was already uh, being fired for the Navy. And so they made a, what we call a pressure-fed version uh, in which you just use compressed gas to blow the propellants out of the tank and into the combustion chambers. And that became the engine for the X-1. The engine was called the XLR-11. It needed development before it was ready to operate under flight conditions. When the first X-1, serial number 6062, rolled out of Bell's plant at Wheatfield, New York in December 1945, the Reaction Motors XLR-11 engine was not yet in a condition to be installed. The decision to use rocket power for the X-1 meant the airplane couldn't be ground launched without wasting fuel that should be used in high-speed test flight. Instead, it would be dropped at altitude from a specially adapted B-29 bomber. A loading pit was designed so that the B-29 could be towed into position over the X-1. The X-1 was then attached to the B-29's bomb shackles and hoisted up under the fuselage, ready for launching at altitude. The first X-1 was taken to Pine Castle Air Force Base in Florida for a series of glide tests. Because the XLR-11 rocket engine wasn't ready, ballast was fitted into the X-1 to compensate. The job of piloting the X-1 in these initial glide flights belonged to Bell's flamboyant chief test pilot, Jack Woolhams, who had been flying with Bell since 1941. Delays with the delivery of the XLR-11 engine caused political pressure to mount. The glide flights out of Pine Castle Air Force Base were important to get the program underway and collect some initial data. On January 19, 1946, the X-1 number one was ready for its first glide test. The B-29 took off from Pine Castle Air Force Base with the X-1 shackled to its belly. The glide flights usually began from an altitude of 25,000 feet. Jack Willems reported that the dropping characteristics were ideal. Through February and into March, Willems flew another nine glide tests out of Pine Castle. Extreme slow motion film was taken to study the drop characteristics in detail. On March 6, Willems made the 10th glide flight. It was his last in the X-1. He was killed in a high performance Bell P-39 
just before the 1946 Thompson Trophy race. In the meantime, the second X-1 was completed. Larry Bell showed it off to the Air Force with the XLR-11 installed. It was to be taken to Muroc Dry Lake in California to begin the power test program, while the number one plane came back to the Bell plant for modification. With the death of Jack Woolhams, the job of chief test pilot went to Tex Johnston on the left. Dick Frost was X-1 crew chief, and Bob Stanley on the right was Bell's chief engineer. This is Edwards Air Force Base in the Mojave Desert, north of Los Angeles. Today, it is the Center for Air Force Test Flight Operations, a highly developed facility with a long and distinguished flight test record. The facility here began to be developed in the early 1940s. Then it was called Muroc after Muroc Dry Lake. The X-1 number two arrived at Muroc on October 7, 1946, carried under the B-29. The X-1 was to be flown by Chalmers Goodland, Bell's new chief experimental test pilot. This is the X-1 loading pit at the south base at Edwards as it looks today. In the early post-war years, experimental programs like the X-1 attracted a group of talented young men to Muroc. All of the best wanted to be here because it was here that they could kind of pit their skills against their peers. And every one of these guys was very competitive in one way or another. The airplanes were outstanding as far as uh, the different kinds that you flew. The people were outstanding. That's uh, one of the things I remember most is uh, they were dedicated, competitive. The flying required rigid discipline. You had to fly a profile exactly or as close to that as you could, the way it had been planned, because the purpose of the flight was to collect data. And if you freelanced or if you screwed up in some way, uh, the data would probably be no good. In this atmosphere of competition and discipline, relaxation was a necessity. An establishment close to the base called the Happy Bottom Riding Club, belonging to distinguished aviatrix and extraordinary character Poncho Barnes, became a focal point for off-duty activity at Muroc. In the 1930s, Poncho made a name for herself in air races. She was the ideal person to provide entertainment for test pilots. Poncho uh, was perhaps uh, one of the most profane people who ever lived in terms of her vocabulary. She seemed to fit right in with these rowdy airmen. And, and there was just kind of a, uh, an incredible affinity between them. Poncho's place gained notoriety uh, really less for its equestrian activities than for the, uh, the much rumored escapades of the young ladies that Poncho hired to serve as hostesses. Poncho's is a part of the good old days around this place. This is where these guys went to, to celebrate their victories, sometimes to mourn their losses. Uh, Poncho was their friend. Uh, she helped a lot of people out when they were in trouble if they needed money, if they needed a, a meal, they needed a place to stay. Uh, and it was at Poncho's where these guys could party, just have a good time. Well, I think everybody that was ever experienced Poncho Bonds. Yes, that was a good place to get a good steak. Chalmers Goodlin was known universally by his nickname Slick. He flew Spitfires for the Royal Air Force in the war and was a U.S. Navy pilot before joining Bell. Before the program of powered flights began, Goodland had a series of glide flights to become familiar with the handling characteristics of the X-1. The B-29 carrying the X-1 would climb to 25,000 feet. Before it reached the drop altitude, the X-1 pilot had to climb down in the blast of the slipstream through the B-29's open belly and slide into the X-1 cockpit. Once the pilot was comfortably seated, a B-29 crew member placed the X-1's cockpit door in position. The X-1 pilot then locked it from the inside.
The X-1 launch was controlled from inside the B-29. As the X-1 dropped away from the B-29, it would be joined by a P-80 chase plane. The chase would observe the flight of the X-1 flying close beside it until it was safely back on the Muroc lake bed. While Slick Goodland completed four glide flights in the number two plane at Muroc, X-1 number one was back at the Bell plant having a thinner wing fitted. By the time it was delivered to Muroc on April 5, 1947, Goodland had carried out 12 powered flights on the number two plane, reaching a maximum speed of Mach 0.8, or eight-tenths the speed of sound, in January 1947. At this stage, the program was going well. After an initial problem in December, when the B-29 was forced to land, still carrying the X-1 and its load of volatile fuel, the flights had been straightforward, and Goodland reported that the airplane possessed perfect control. The number one plane, with its new thin wing and modified tail, promised better performance than X-1 number two. There was even some horseplay on the tarmac at Muroc. The reaction motor's XLR-11 rocket engine was fueled with liquid oxygen and a water-alcohol mixture. Fuel was fed into the combustion chamber by pressure from nitrogen gas, which also provided cockpit pressurization for high-altitude flight. Although the clean lines of the X-1's fuselage made it look simple, under the skin it was a highly complex machine with the pressurized cockpit, the rocket engine, two propellant tanks, 12 nitrogen spheres, three pressure regulators, and more than 500 pounds of flight test instrumentation. On April 10, 1947, Slick Goodland made one glide flight in the number one airplane, 6062, before beginning a program of powered flights. It was successful. And the following day, 6062 was prepared for its first flight under the power of the reaction motor's XLR-11 rocket engine. It was now 14 months since the same airplane was dropped over Florida with Jack Woolhams at the controls for its first glide flight. All the X-1 flights were monitored from the ground by what was then a sophisticated telemetry system. On its first powered flight, 6062 was dropped from an altitude of 20,000 feet. Slick Goodland took it out to a speed of Mach 0.77. Under the terms of its contract, the Bell Company was required to test both airplanes to Mach 0.8. In the month from late April, Goodland made six more powered flights, but the speed he reached on the first flight wasn't improved on. There was talk of demands for large amounts of bonus money for flying the X-1 at higher speeds. Flight test reports from Slick Goodland indicated no problem with the airplane, but the program didn't appear to be progressing. Tex Johnston was back at the Bell headquarters in Buffalo. He heard some disturbing news. And the military wasn't uh, real happy with the day that we were getting, and uh, so I was chief pilot then, of course, uh, at that point for Bell Aircraft, and uh, so I went to Muroc and flew the airplane. Although he hadn't flown the X-1, Tex Johnston knew it well in theory, having been involved in consultation on the cockpit layout. On April 22, 1947, 
He climbed into the X-1 and prepared for launch. I was flying at 0.72, uh, 7200 the speed of sound at that, which uh, was fast in those days. But, uh, and the airplane was just gorgeous. You could wrap it up and fly it. But the only problem was the trim. And the trim was, was uh, too sensitive. You, you just barely touch it and it would over trim. Either way, it was uh, unusable at, at really high speed. So you, you only have a few minutes of fuel, you know, and so by that time I'm out of fuel, and so I came in and landed and grounded the airplane for um, modification of the trim system and relocation of the control to the switch so you can run it with your thumb. At the time, Captain Charles Yeager was a young fighter pilot not long out of test pilot training. There was a hassle, not between Bell and the Air Force, but between the Bell test pilot and the Bell company on contract and bonus money and how it was to be paid. And the Air Force, since they were footing the whole bill, sat back and sort of watched this thing, you know, being, being drawn out. And then they noticed also a, a de being delayed. And we wanted to get on with the program. Although Bell was a manufacturing contractor, the X-1 program was controlled by the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics, NACA, and the Army Air Force. I think at that time, NACA did not want the military to get involved in research flying. You know, the military's job is to fight wars. Well, the Air Force, when they saw this marvelous opportunity to latch onto the X-1, uh, it opened up the, the whole future to us in research flying. And I think Colonel Boyd saw that. Colonel Al Boyd was chief of flight testing. He was an old-fashioned soldier. Uh, he imposed rigid discipline. Uh, he was a very strict disciplinarian. And nobody, believe me, nobody tried to, to uh, lock horns with Al Boyd. Boyd was a fine administrator and an accomplished pilot. He was well equipped to select the Army Air Force test pilot for the X-1. This is the Edwards Air Force Base control tower today. It's the hub of flight operations on a base that has seen 50 years of advanced flight testing. In 1947, Colonel Al Boyd made a decision that had great influence on shaping the evolution of the Air Force Test Flight Center. Boyd did a masterful job of selecting. I know at one time, prior to going out there, he asked me who I thought uh, should be the X-1 pilot. Of course, I, I said Captain Edwards, because Captain Edwards had a PhD in aeronautical engineering and was a pretty good stick and rudder guy too. He said, nah, if we put uh, Edwards uh, on it, he'll, he'll wind up being the test pilot and the test engineer. And if something should happen, you know, God forbid, we lose everything. Uh, Chuck is a pilot, Ridley's a test engineer. If something happens, we have somebody left. Chuck was a, uh, starting as a test pilot, he had a, a, a remarkable uh, affinity for machines. He's not an engineer, uh, but he has a, a great feeling for machinery. And in those days, you didn't have the telemetry and all the stuff you have now to, to record flights, so a lot of it depended on what the pilot could tell him when he landed. And he was quite good at uh, explaining uh, you know, what had gone on in the flight and, and suggesting what might be the next step. But when it got into some of the explanations as to why, things were happening, then I'd have to consult Jack Ridley, because Jack had the, the ability to speak my language. Chuck Yeager was a distinguished fighter pilot, but he was relatively new to flight testing. Boyd assembled a strong support team for him. Jack Ridley on the right was an engineer and pilot. Bob Hoover at left rear was also a backup pilot. Major Bob Cardenas was the B-29 pilot and senior officer. I was in charge of the X-1 project. That doesn't mean I was Chuck's boss, per se. Uh, Colonel Boyd was our boss of all of us. I was just the operations officer, 
to make sure that the whole thing went. Being a major who outranked uh, me as a captain and Jack Ridley as a captain and Bob Hoover as a first lieutenant, uh, when we came out to Muroc, uh, he basically was the officer in charge. Uh, he obviously didn't fly the X-1. I was the primary pilot on the X-1, and my backup pilot was Lieutenant Bob Hoover. But the real brain in the, the team was Captain Jack Ridley. Two members of the Bell Aircraft X-1 flight test crew joined the Army Air Force test team. They were Bell Project Engineer Dick Frost and Crew Chief Jack Russell. Jaeger, Ridley, and Hoover were sent to Bell's facility at Buffalo to familiarize themselves with the X-1. But there was really only one person who had a body of experience flying the airplane. Jaeger approached Slick Goodland for a test pilot's insight. We had no one to talk to. And uh, like I had a meeting with Slick Goodland and said, you know, what, what kind of technique you use for landing, uh, what kind of speed you use for landing, and uh, some of the pilot, you know, talk. He was so ticked off uh, that the Air Force had taken the program away from him. Uh, he said, well, if the, the Air Force wants to enter into a contract uh, with me to check you out in the airplane, you know, it'll cost a few thousand bucks. And, that's, and I, as I recall, I looked at him and said, I figure if you can fly it, I can fly it. And that was the end of that. On August 6, 1947, Chuck Yeager was dropped in the X-1 for the first time. It was a glide flight. It was easy for me to discipline myself into research flying. And uh, I just had a little better, probably, hand-eye coordination. I had better visual acuity than uh, most pilots. And uh, the one thing that gave me a big advantage, uh, more than anything else, was the ability to understand machinery. I was trained as a young boy to work on engines and uh, mechanical things uh, by my father. And then I was trained as a, as a maintenance type in the Air Force before I became a pilot. The X-1 was a, a very complex piece of machinery, and it was easy for me to understand it. Uh, the ability to fly an airplane, you know, is sort of secondary. Anybody's got that if they're trained for it. Jaeger made two more glide flights in the X-1 in the next two days. He'd already set tongues wagging when he rolled the X-1 just after launch on the first flight, and on the third, he performed a two-turn spin. The X-1 test program shifted into a completely new gear. The Army Air Force was about to change. In July 1947, President Truman signed a document that would bring an independent United States Air Force into existence on September 18th. NACA appointed their own test pilots for the X-1. Their test program in the number two airplane, 6063, was also planned to start in September. The Air Force team concentrated on X-1 number one. I did all the flying on the number one airplane, 6062, because we were interested in high speed and you didn't have the drag on the real thin wings that you had on the thick wing that was on the number two airplane. The fastest the Bell pilots had flown the X-1 was eight-tenths the speed of sound. The Air Force's plan, in consultation with NACA, was to make a series of flights that began where Bell had left off and approach Mach 1 in small increments of speed. Chuck Yeager painted a name on the side of the X-1. He called it Glamorous Glennis after his wife. He was ready to fly under power. It was my job to see the B-29 was operating, normal, loaded, everything. But then I had to taxi it over to where they had dug a pit so the X-1 could fit down in the hole. And then they towed the B-29. I was in charge of that part until it came time to actually load the X-1 up into the B-29 and put it on the bomb racks. Then it was a combination of Russell, the crew chief on the X-1, and my crew chief on the B-29, uh, as well as Dick Frost, and of course, Chuck Berry interested in the whole thing too. It's early morning at Muroc. The B-29 with 6062 slung tightly against its belly is taxied into position for fueling. 
600 gallons of water alcohol mixture and liquid oxygen are pumped aboard the X-1. It's a volatile combination. The P-80 chase planes are prepared for flight. Their role is critical to mission safety. Bob Cardenas prepares for the takeoff. My only problem I faced was on takeoff, I could not lift the nose wheel of the airplane more than about 11 inches off the ground without scraping the tail of the X-1. And of course, if you scrape the tail of the X-1 with the volatile fuel you had on board, there might be a problem. The process of dropping the X-1 was not always straightforward. You use a plain B-5 bomb shackle, you know, it's designed for a 2,000 pound bomb and hang some 14,000 pounds on it and, and you have to have a safety system where you have a pin in it to keep from it releasing autom uh, inadvertently uh, and, and the human element sometimes, a couple of times we released the X-1, pulled the release handle without pulling the safety pin out and that bound it up and uh, all in all it was a an amusing thing every once in a while when he's sitting in there, sitting in the X-1. So it's, what in the Christ is going on up there, you know? If the X-1 wouldn't release, its fuel had to be jettisoned. We dumped as much of the uh, fuel as we could, uh, that is the X-1, overboard, but uh, I still had to land with it connected. Chuck stayed in it. He didn't trust anybody. <laughs> he was gonna make damn sure that um, if it, if, if it did release inadvertently, at least he'd be in it to, to fly it away. Of course, when he got down to, I forget how high we were, but when it got down low enough where he figured he wouldn't have a chance to fly it anyway, he crawled back out and came up on board. Chuck Yeager made his first powered flight on August 29th, 1947. Basically, the engine was really, really neat. And with rocket power, I'd never experienced it before. It was smooth, quiet, and when everything worked, it was beautiful. And the uh, same way with the, on the first powered flight, I took it up to about 0.85 Mach number, which is, you know, five hundredths of a Mach number above what's the belt people had flown it. Colonel Boyd wasn't impressed. The airplane accelerated so fast, I went up to about eight five first, and when I came down and wrote up my report, you know he he got a little little stern with me. He said, you know, why did you go above eight two Mach numbers? And I said, well, that, that, I was flying the airplane. Uh, it felt good. I saw nothing wrong with letting it accelerate out a little bit. But he said, you know, just just don't don't compromise safety. And that was one thing he was very stern about. Speed was gradually increased over a series of flights. We'd run it on out to 0 .9, 0 0.92 Mach number and got into buffeting. It was pretty, pretty heavy buffeting. And then at 0.94 Mach number, we're sitting there in pretty heavy buffeting. I rolled the airplane over and to pull three Gs at 94 Mach number, and we had no control of the airplane. The elevators were totally useless. And uh, what we did, then we just rolled it out and turned off the rockets and came down and said, man, we got a real problem because it had been predicted the X-1 would either pitch up or down in the region of the speed of sound, and then we couldn't control it. If we couldn't control it in that region, we were in trouble. The X-1's horizontal stabilizer assembly could be moved to adjust the trim of the airplane. We had never used this horizontal stabilizer in flight because we, we just trimmed it out at two degrees nose down and left it there because that's where the airplane flew good. And uh, that was where old Jack Ridley's brain came into effect. He said, after looking at a lot of the data, 
it showed that this shock wave, which had formed on the fixed part of the horizontal stabilizer, as we increased our Mach number, the shock wave moved back and sort of laying down. Well, at 9-4 Mach number, it was at the hinge point of the elevator, and we lost our elevator effectiveness. And Jack Ridley said, you know, if, if, let's try to fly the airplane with the horizontal stabilizer. And if you think you're good enough to do it, it may save your tail. Five young kids out in the desert, uh, we rolled it into the hangar. Jackie went down to Lancaster and got a worm gear, and uh, we uh, fixed the elevator neutral, modified the tail a little bit so that Chuck could actually work the whole tail, which later became known as the flying tail. Then we went up and tried to fly the airplane with the horizontal stabilizer, and that when we found out that we could, that solved all of our problems. It was a tremendously important breakthrough, one that had a swift and profound effect on the design of high-performance aircraft, first in the United States and later around the world. As the X-1 project approached the speed of sound, there was discussion with NACA experts and academics about the hazard of exceeding Mach 1. We had four PhDs descended on Mirac. Uh, Mr. Soule, Dr. Soule was one of them from Ames Laboratory. I believe Dr. Perkins from Princeton and Caltech and MIT. A real power. Well, Jackie Ridley took them on in the old tar paper operations shack at the blackboard. Chuck and I sat there and listened to them. And for a long period of time, they were going at it. At the end, it was a draw. Uh, Jackie couldn't convince them that uh, we could do it, and they couldn't convince Jackie that we were going to kill Chuck. The Air Force's ninth powered flight was scheduled for October 14, 1947. The program was close to reaching Mach 1. I really hadn't coordinated too much with John Boyd, but I thought I better let him know. So I called Boyd on the phone. I appraised him of the situation as it stood. And the old son of a gun, he, <clears throat> he didn't say do it, he didn't say don't do it. He just said, well, good luck, that's it. Which um, I interpreted as a go ahead, so we did. The goal was to advance our Mach number every flight, go faster. That particular day uh, we was to go, we didn't know we were going to get above Mach 1. We, number one, we didn't know if we could or not. Uh, so we had gotten out to about 0.94 or 95 Mach number on the previous flight, and we said, well, maybe we can squeeze it out to about 9.6 or 9.7. Early in the morning of October 14th, the X-1 was loaded aboard the B-29 and fueled. Electronic equipment for monitoring the flight was checked. By now, the extremely low temperature of the fuel in the X-1 would have cold-soaked the airplane. When Chuck Yeager climbed into the cockpit, it would be like entering an icebox. But today he had extra discomfort. Last evening, something happened that could threaten the success and safety of flight number nine. As Jaeger maneuvered his way down toward the cockpit of the X-1, he was in pain. The pain intensified as he bent to go through the cockpit door. Late the previous evening, he'd gone horseback riding in the desert with his wife, Glennis. It was getting dark. We'd gone out this gate, we were coming back and I was in the lead running, 
and somebody closed the gate, and it's dark, and the first thing, the time you see the gates closed, you're almost on it, and it kind of peeled the horse around. He, as I say, he couldn't pull more than about three Gs, but the, uh, the horse hit the fence and flipped off, and it threw me through the air, and I had landed on my right side and, and busted a couple of ribs, and it hurt, yes. I elected to uh, go ahead with Chuck, because uh, uh, there are certain people that are born I hate to use the word lucky, because his skill gives him that luck. But uh, uh, nothing ever happened real bad to Chuck. I talked to Jack Ridley and I said, Jack, I, I got a problem. I, you know, I, I really hurt. I don't know if I can get in the X one or not, because uh, when you went down this ladder and had to hump over, bend double, or slide in this door, it was really painful. The X-1's cockpit door had to be secured from the inside using the pilot's right hand. Chuck Yeager's right side was too painful to do it. Jack Ridley had a solution. And he said, well, I can fix that. And he got a, about a 10, 12 inch piece of broomstick and I could use my left hand, stick this broomstick in the lever on the door and raise it with my left hand and lock it. And that, that's, uh, we decided that's the way I'd do it. Jaeger eased his way into the cockpit. Jack Ridley placed the door in position, and using the broom handle, Jaeger locked it from the inside. Jaeger went through the pre-flight check procedures and waited for the B-29 to reach drop altitude. Finally, up around um, above 20,000 feet or so, it was my job to get that airplane over a certain position and over the ground in space at a certain given altitude uh, because a telemeter was going to pick up the drop. I had a problem in that uh, if I went too fast, that B-29 used to start shaking and shuddering so much. I wasn't afraid of it, but I was afraid maybe that's what might have caused the bomb rack to lock up that one time. At 45,000 feet, the X-1 was dropped. Of course, the B-29 would uh, jerk up uh, because of the loss of weight sudden, like a bomb release, you might say. Seconds later, I could expect to see a P-80 uh, buzz right up underneath my nose, straight up, and that was Bob Hoover, the chase pilot. Uh, he took great delight in um, letting me know he was there. I could control my acceleration rate by angle of climb. If I wanted to go rather slow, I could steepen it up and just barely accelerate uh, or drop the nose and pick up speed fast. And I was sitting there at about 955, 9.6 indicated, you know, just getting ready to sit. And the Mach meter jumped off the scale. When it did, all the buffeting stopped. Uh, because then it's supersonic flow over the whole airplane. And it came as a complete surprise, and the old nose started dropping on the airplane, so I rolled in a little leading edge down the horizontal stabilizer to keep the nose up. And uh, that's a piece of, yeah, it's a piece of cake. Yeah. And we held it out there for about 20 seconds, and then I turned off the three chambers and decelerated back through, and I got the Mach meter jumped back to 9.6. And that's what happened as, as the shockwave passed over the pitot head, then we got true Mach number indicated then, and, and we were made, it went supersonic, we made the sonic boom, uh, the shockwave was formed on the airplane. Chuck, of course, landed out at the, on a dry lake bed, and when you consider what he did, you know, the phenomenal feat that he did, um, there were no bands to meet him, no, no, no media, no television, of course, Nothing. Uh, he was just out. We had to send a jeep out there to tow the plane in, and he rode rode back on the wing of the on the X-1. When I landed, uh, the uh, not all of them, but some of the PhDs were there, and they didn't want to talk to me. They didn't want to talk to Jackie Ridley, <laughs> and one of them tossed one of his books in a in a waste barrel that was there. Uh, said, Jackie, come on, we got to rewrite the book. When we got the airplane above Mach 1, it surprised us, I think. And they said, but 
it really didn't impress us as much as it does now when you look back on it. We went back to right field, and uh, Mr. Larry Bell, the owner of Bell Aircraft, uh, he, had, he held a little party at the Dayton Biltmore Hotel in Dayton, Ohio. We had dinner, we had some drinks, and uh, we celebrated uh, quietly with Mr. Bell. There was one major factor in the X-1's successful assault on the speed of sound. The one thing, finding out that you needed a flying tail to operate in the region of the speed of sound was really the big breakthrough in getting an airplane above the speed of sound. And it, uh, it really paid off. Uh, the X-1 was classified. You know, the data that we were getting from the X-1, we didn't share it with the rest of the world. We kept it to ourselves. We fed it to the aircraft industry. And that one thing, finding out about the flying tail with the X-1, it gave us a quantum leap on the rest of the world in aerodynamics. The Douglas D-5582 was part of the U.S. Navy's transonic and supersonic research program. The program began in 1945 and developed at the same time as the X-1. The D-5582's predecessor was a straight-wing jet-powered airplane that could fly close to the speed of sound after ground takeoff. The D-5582 had swept wings, it had rocket power, and it was designed to fly well in excess of Mach 1, also taking off from the ground. On January 5, 1949, the X-1 crew prepared for their own ground takeoff. The X-1 couldn't get off the ground with a full load of fuel. The gear wasn't designed to take that weight. So we only put a, uh, roughly 60% of the capacity of the fuel in it, uh, liquid oxygen and water alcohol. And we drug the airplane down on the lake bed and There was a degree of rivalry in the decision to make this flight. The Navy supporters of the D-558-1 and 2 suggested that dropping an airplane from 45,000 feet to exceed the speed of sound was cheating. Such a view could not be allowed to go unchallenged. In the true spirit of the intense competition of test flying, the X-1 crew was showing that their airplane was capable of anything the Navy could do. But there were risks. The X-1's landing gear was subject to failure. The stresses of a ground takeoff, even with only 60% of the fuel capacity, would be great. Fired off two chambers together and then two more together, and that airplane broke ground about 1,600 feet and flipped the gear and flaps up, and it was accelerating so fast that it busted the push-pull rod on the flaps and popped them right up. The airplane kind of kind of sunk a little bit. I held it up. And uh, then I just pulled the airplane up into an Emmelman, and 100 seconds was all the fuel that we had from ignition to burnout. And then at 100 seconds, I did an Emmelman roll out at 23,000 feet at, a, at supersonic speed, ran out of fuel, came down and landed, and the whole flight lasted about four minutes. After jettisoning his remaining fuel, Jaeger brought the X-1 in for a smooth landing on the lake bed. This flight in January 1949 came to have long-term historical significance. It remains the only ground launch of a manned, rocket-propelled aircraft with the X designation. But for Chuck Yeager and the X-1 crew, there was a double dose of satisfaction. Apart from the failure of the flaps, the flight had been a spectacular success. The X-1 had held together. But more than that, honor had been satisfied. We did that because the Navy and Douglas was sort of bad-mouthing the X-1. There was a trick. We, just, we did it the day before the D-558 Phase II flew. And boy, there were some long faces. 